because this is such a holistic area of psychology, there's lots of different types of research designs we can use in development. For example, we can think about experiments, quasi-experiments, and correlations. We can do longitudinal, cross-sectional, and sequential research designs. What does that all mean? Well, let's jump into it. By experimental, we're talking about a study where all independent variables are manipulated by the researchers. By manipulated by the researchers, we mean that all independent variables can be chosen and randomly selected after the participants have entered the research lab. So after you get your participants there, regardless of who your participants are, you can randomly assign them to things. And if you're randomly assigning them to things, and those things are, are all your factors that you're interested in, then it's an experiment. So let's do, let's do an example. Let's assume that you want to see the influence of sugar and TV on behavior. And you have two independent variables. One is whether kids watch TV where people are cooperative or when they're competitive. And one is whether they eat sugary foods or non-sugary foods. You can randomly control that. You can get kids into your lab and you can decide randomly who's going to eat the cupcake, who's going to eat the carrot, who's going to watch the TV program where kids get along or when kids fight. Because you can randomly control that, that actually helps us to infer causation. We can make a clearer distinction. If now we're watching the kids how they behave in the lab after they eat the sugar and watch TV, then we can make a more causal inference. However, this is less generalizable because it's less close to mimicking reality. What they do in the lab may not actually predict what they do outside the lab. Then we have quasi-experimental studies. This is when some of the factors are manipulated after participants have entered the lab and some are not. Some things might not be manipulated because we can't manipulate them. Like let's say we want to compare how boys versus girls respond to aggressive TV. We can't choose a child's gender after they have entered the lab. So this would be a quasi-experimental. Or we want to look at how this might change at different ages, age two versus age six. We also cannot randomly choose that after children have entered the lab. So that would also be quasi-experimental. It would only be quasi-experimental if we're still randomizing at least one variable. So if we're still randomly picking who watches what when they enter the lab. We can also do this where it could be something we could randomize, but we choose not to. Perhaps we choose not to randomize what they ate the day before they went to the lab. So maybe we just ask them when they get to the lab, what was your lunch? And we see how sugary it was or how non-sugary it was. We're not manipulating that, we're not randomizing it, we're just measuring it. And so because of that, we're still randomizing the TV. So one of the things is manipulated and one is not. And it allows for moderate levels of causal inference and moderate levels of generalizability. Then we have correlation studies and also case studies. And in both of these, we're not manipulating anything. We're just measuring. So we're not manipulating anything when they come to the lab. In fact, for these studies, we don't need people to come to the lab at all. We just need to ask them. So we could send out a survey or an online questionnaire asking people about what kind of shows they watch and asking people about what kind of food they eat. And then we could ask their parents how hyperactive they are. We could also take them to the lab and observe how hyperactive they are and give them the surveys there. But the important thing is, is we're not choosing what they watch and we're not choosing what they eat. And so because of that, we're not actually um, manipulating anything. This allows for the greatest level of generalizability because this is most close to what they would do without being in the experiment at all. However, it also has the lowest causal inference. We can't actually say this causes that in most correlation studies. We definitely can't say that in case studies. So a case study is often when you're following one or a small group of people and you report what's going on with them in detail. But that is usually such a special case, there's almost no generalizability whatsoever. So all three of these types, experiments, quasi-experiments, correlations, or even case studies can be done in developmental psychology. Now in terms of how we do them, we could do them in a variety of different ways. One way we can conduct these studies could be through a longitudinal methodology. This could be done through testing the same participants at multiple time points. Perhaps we want to test how problem solving is different in infants versus children versus adults. How we want to follow the same group of people. We could. We could get a group of infants into the lab and test them on a variety of problem solving skills. And then we could get them back in the lab when they are children. And then we could get the same group back in the lab when they're adults. It's possible. It's also going to take a really long time and the researcher has to be prepared to be active in their research career for that length of time. This is very expensive 
and very time onerous, but it can allow us to see that individual development if we get the same, let's say 150 people over time, and it can allow us to infer causation. We can also do a shorter term longitudinal study where instead of over years, we could look over months, or we could look from grade one to grade two to grade three. Again, that is less onerous than following someone from infancy to adulthood, and it's still longitudinal, but it still costs a lot and you have to follow people up and bring them to the lab multiple times and give them incentives or pay them to come to the lab. And some people will invariably drop out of the study and by the second or third time, you're gonna have a much smaller sample. An alternative to a longitudinal design is a cross-sectional design. And this is the idea, if we wanna look at how problem solving is different in infancy, childhood and adulthood, we could go out in the same week and we could test infants, children, adults, we could even test elders but they're not gonna be the same person we test multiple times. Instead, we're testing multiple people and multiple age groups in one snapshot view. This is quicker, it's a lot more efficient, it's a lot more easy to get the data, and there tends to be more consistency in your methods. You're not using different research assistants that are trained years apart from one another. You can be sure that the methodology is more similar across your participants. However, it's harder for you to infer causation with this and you can't see the individual development, it's possible that the group of kids you found were just qualitatively different than the group of adults you found. And one of the things that might make them qualitatively different is what's known as a cohort effect. This is the idea that people that are elders today didn't grow up with the internet versus people that are kids today have grown up with the internet. And that type of cohort effect might shape how they would perform differently in your study. And so there could be all kinds of cohort differences that you may not even be aware of if you're just doing a cross-sectional design. An alternative to both the longitudinal and cross-sectional design is the sequential design. And so a sequential design is when you do a hybrid of both. What happens is at time one, you go out and you get a snapshot. You get a cross-sectional design of infants, kids, and adults, or grade one, grade two, grade three, whatever, whatever groups you're interested in. And that's time one, time one is cross-sectional. Then you follow up with all the groups. So you don't just get longitudinal on one of them, you get longitudinal on as many as you can. You go out again at time two, when those infants are now kids, the kids are now adults, and the adults are now elders, and you get another round of data. Then you go out for a third time and you get another round of data when the kids are now adults and the adults are now elders. Some of your elders may have died off. And so what happens is sequential is there is a lot of attrition, same as longitudinal, but with sequential, we actually tend to replace participants. And because you're recruiting multiple groups at multiple time points, it becomes more easy to add new participants in time two and time three, so your sample doesn't get too small in those time points. This type of model allows for the maximum statistical flexibility, it allows for beautiful causal inference, it allows for great testing. However, it's expensive. It tends to cost the most amount of money to conduct because you're following the most amount of groups, you need the most amount of research assistance and the most amount of different things on the go. It tends to be the most ideal, but often the most complex and the most undoable. But that being said, there's lots of choices. There's even lots of choices in the type of data we collect. In, the, in, in developmental psychology, we can collect physiological data like brain waves or eye tracking data or sweat or cortisol in your saliva. We can also look at observation data through recordings or through observing someone in the playground or in a research lab. We can do assessments or tests where there's uh, right or wrong answers like IQ tests or math reading tests or mathematical tests or reading tests. And we can also do surveys or interviews where there's no right or wrong answer, it's just your attitude. And what do you think about different things? That can be done verbally or written or online or what have you. But regardless of which type of data you're collecting, it's important that the data you're collecting is both valid and reliable. Validity refers to the fact that you're actually measuring the construct or the variable you think you're measuring. So if something was not valid, let's say we wanna measure IQ, but our test of IQ is not valid. It's not actually measuring how smart someone is. It's measuring if their parents read to them, or if their parents had money, or if they're fluent in Chinese. And so this would be a problem because now it's not measuring intelligence, it's measuring all these other things, and it would be considered an invalid test. We also want a test to be reliable. This is the idea it's going to give us the true level of a trait. And so if you're measuring intelligence, and it is measuring intelligence, but it's off by a bit, or it doesn't consistently give you the right score, it's not going to be a good measure. You can imagine an IQ test that's neither valid nor reliable. It'd be something that would change day to day and be influenced by things that are not intelligence, 
Let's assume we made a test that was influenced by how much sleep you got, or if you ate sugar before the test, or if it was sunny outside. That would be a very poor test of intelligence because it's testing all these other things. And rather than hitting the bullseye in the middle every time, it would be widespread and all over.